What should an IIT student do? Well, of course, you must uh, must study hard because these uh, four years of it that you do here, uh, we cannot be easily recalled again. These are the parts of your formative years, and you should really concentrate on that. You should not look at anything else. I'm saying this because your IIT. I will not give this lecture in JNU where people don't study at all. <laughs> You come through a tough competitive exams, by and large, there's no, everybody's looking over everybody's shoulder. There's hardly any case of you coming through corrupt methods. So, therefore, this generation, and remember, India is blessed with the youngest population today of the large countries. Average age of Indians today is only 26 years. Average age of a Chinese is 35 years because they put this heavy uh, one child per family restriction on their population growth. In India also they tried in the emergency, but our people were smarter, they voted him out. <laughs> so, nobody is saying that you should have unlimited children, not at all. But, in fact, our birth rates have been coming down consistently since 1952. And uh, as your economic strength grows and as your children, as the parents now realize that it costs a lot of money to give a really good education to children, people are automatically doing it. They're controlling their, uh, their, their family size. But this forcible thing that was done in China, China is regretting it today. Chinese leaders tell me that there was a big mistake they did. I said, we also did that mistake, but we have democracy, so we, we escaped. <laughs> you also should try democracy. <laughs> so, this 75% uh, of our population today is below the age of 35. And this is the young population which is going to do research for the future. And I have told you, innovation is the key for economic growth. Economists have, who have done statistical work on growth, they have found that not less than 65% of fast-growing countries, the growth rate is due to innovation. Mm -hmm. And only 35% is for more capital and more labor. The American uh, uh, miracle, as it's called, is due to the fact that 75% was due to innovations. The Japanese is 64%. And England uh, achieved the Industrial Revolution because of 85% uh, due to these new innovations that came due to science. So therefore, I would say this requires a new mindset. And that mindset must be, make you confident. And that confidence, how does that come? You must be proud of your heritage. If you are taught that you are beaten, uh, you are always, anybody came from abroad, they beat you and took it over, or that you are in a, a set of multiple races who have come from different parts of the world through the Khyber Pass, this kind of thing, then you will not feel the bonding that is necessary for Indians to work together. And all this, if it was true, you can teach it. It's all false. The, uh, the Indian today, if you look at the DNA, is from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, from Jamnagar to uh, Dibugar. The DNA in its core is the same. We are one people. We don't come from anywhere else. This Aryan Dravidian theory is totally bogus. It was invented by the British. There is no word called Aryan in, in our literature. There's a word called Arya. Arya just means an accomplished person. The British theory was previously they were all Dravidians. And uh, uh, the Aryans came from Europe through Khyber Pass and beat the Dravidians down to the south. And uh, so therefore we are two nations. We are two communities. And they sold it in Tamil Nadu. They even started a Dravidian movement then a DMK, Dravidian Munitakaram, Dravidian Progressive Party. And they started propagating all this. In fact, the DMK 
began celebrating Ravan Lila, saying that Ravan was the king of uh, Lanka. Rama came from North India. He was an Aryan, and Ravan was a Dravidian. So he killed a Dravidian. So why we should uh, have Ram Lila in our South India, in Tamil Nadu? We will have Raman Lila. <laughs> so I explained to Karnanidhi that Raman was not from South India. He was born near Delhi in a place called Basarat village in Noida. <laughs> you come to Delhi, you go to Noida, you will ask for Basarat village. Bisrak village. They will tell you this is where, and there's a board there. The Ravan was born here. <laughs> they don't, they don't celebrate Diwali there, by the way. Ravan went to uh, Ravan married Mandodri. She was from Meerut, and he went to Kailash and prayed to Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva gave him a boon that, uh, except on a, a particular uh, part of your body, unless you are not attacked, then nobody can. Uh, kill you. That secret uh, Vibhishana knew and he told Rama about it. That's how Rama, uh, Rama died in the end. But Raman came to the uh, south because Sri Lanka was made very beautiful and, pro and pro progress. Uh, the progress was tremendous due to Guber, his relative, who transformed to Sri Lanka. So he came, comforted and became the king. It took a long time for me to persuade Karnanidhi that he finally gave up. But he never gave up. Uh, abusing Rama. I remember once I was fired, uh, arguing a case in the Supreme Court that the Setu Samudran project will disrupt and rupture uh, Rama Setu and that we cannot allow because there are alternative ways of, of connecting uh, uh, Chennai and uh, Kanyakumari without having to go around Sri Lanka. And I argued and uh, I remember Karnanidhi got very upset that who is Swami to call this Ram Setu? He asked uh, publicly, did, uh, did Rama Setu go to an uh, engineering college? Did he get an engineering degree? Which engineering degree? He tried to make fun like that. But a few days later he fell sick. So he went to be admitted to a hospital. And the hospital's name was Ramachandra Medical Hospital. <laughs> So did Rama have an MBBS? <laughs> so, I mean, this kind of uh, uh, you know brainwashing has taken place during the British time because Macaulay said very clearly that we are uh, our focus is to create an Indian in skin color, but in habits, in attitudes, in the worship of the British culture, he he uh, we will. Thoroughly brainwashed for that. Not in those words, but he said thoroughly will prepare him for that. So our whole education system is to make him feel inferior. This country never bowed to any foreigner. They fought and fought and finally liberated the country. That's the true history. But that's not what we are being taught. You see, Islam came to India and was here 800 years. In, 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 in power. In, in Persia, which was that time 100% Zoroastrian, Islam went to and conquered Persia. In 15 years, they converted them to 100% Muslim. Mesopotamia, Babylon, which is now combined called Iraq, they converted them to 100% Muslim in 17 years. Egypt was converted in uh, in 21 years to 100% Muslim. There were pharaohs there, they were not Muslim, but they conquered it and then they converted them to 100, uh, 21, in 21 years to 100% Muslim. Christians went to Europe in 50 years, they converted them to 100% uh, Christian. But in India, Muslims ruled for 800 years, British, which meant Christians, ruled for 200 years, and we are still 80% Hindu. What does that mean? Whether it is Shivaji or Ram Pratap, or whether it is the Vijayanagar Empire, whether it is the Ahom dynasty, 
Along dynasty, they were not Chinese, by the way, they were Thais who came here, adopted Hindu religion. And twice they beat the beat the hell out of, I should say, out of the Mughals. So the, so the